Hello, everyone. Welcome. See a few people filing in from the waiting room. A couple of familiar names. I'll give uh, folks a few, a couple of minutes to file in, um, but welcome. Um, if you've been to one of my workshops before, uh, you will recognize this slide. So <laughs> welcome. Um, as you join, feel free to answer these questions in the chat, uh, like where are you joining us from and what you do with WordPress. Hey, Michael, good to see you again. Um, yeah, so the chat button's at the bottom of your screen or under the view menu in Zoom, if uh, you're looking for that. Um, me, I'm based in Hawaii in the US, um, and I do all sorts of things with WordPress. Uh, I'm mainly a contributor to the open source project, so um, doing workshops like these for the training team. Um, I started as a blogger, um, but um, I do all sorts of things. I see, uh, Lance, uh, you're joining from Connecticut, making websites for people. Great. Uh, I have Cami with me, and she's here from Portland, Oregon. I'll be introducing her shortly. Um, Michael from Los Angeles, building client and personal sites. Everything from informational sites to e-commerce to sites that house applications and products. Cool. Great, good to have you. Finally, we have Sally. Hello, Sally. We're just doing some quick introductions. Feel free to say hello in the chat. <laughs> All righty, so if you've never joined one of these online workshops before. Uh, here's another slide that I share every time. So we're here to learn together and encourage you uh, to ask questions at any time. If you know the answer to someone else's question or have anything else to add to the conversation, always feel free to contribute live in the chat. I see Sally has said hello in the chat, hello. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this and other online workshops are recorded, and then we upload these to WordPress TV, uh, WordPress.tv. Um, and also a reminder that online workshops like these are hosted by folks like myself and Cami, who enjoy WordPress and giving back to the community. So if you're interested in hosting a workshop, if you have something um, that's WordPress related that you're enthusiastic about, I'd love to help you um, hold one of these workshops. Um, so please reach out if you're interested in that. So today uh, we'll be talking about the, um, an introduction to DEIB in WordPress, and we have our guest Cami here. Uh, so what we'll be talking about today is what is DEIB, um, what is the importance of DEIB work, and how it applies to WordPress. So there's a lot to talk about in relation to DEIB, so just to, um, to be clear, what we won't be covering today is actually using WordPress, and also any advanced DEIB um, topics like privilege and intersectionality. Although I imagine that Cami is going to have some resources to share at the end if folks are interested. Um, we'll see. Uh, so that said, um, I'd like to introduce you to Cami Chaos um, and yeah, I'll let her take it from here. Hi, hello everyone. I'm Cami Chaos. I'm a former leader of the WordPress community team. I'm currently focusing my volunteer efforts in WordPress on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, which is a sneak peek of the DEIB explanation. Um, and that is also work that I'm doing within Automatic in our talent division. So I'm really happy to see all of you here today. Thank you for joining me. I know Michael mentioned that he saw uh, my talk at WordCamp US. This is gonna have a lot of similarities to it. Uh, this was part of the reason that 
Courtney and I decided to do this workshop today. And so uh, please, at the end, feel free to ask questions if there's anything that's unclear. But uh, for the time being, let's just get uncomfortable with this. This is awkward for me. I've spent most of the past decade trying to create safe and comfortable spaces for people within the WordPress community. And sometimes I did a really great job with that. And sometimes I did not. And when I didn't do a great job, I made a point to work harder and try to do better. Um, and that is just a cycle that doesn't end. Because what I've learned is that just letting some people sit in their own comfort leaves a lot of other people on the outside looking in, feeling excluded, unwelcome, unrepresented, and othered, and uncomfortable. So I like to say from the outset that if you are not being intentionally inclusive, you are being unintentionally exclusive. Usually with these talks, there's a subtle message about DEI being everyone's responsibility. I would like that message to not be subtle. I want all of you to hear it very clearly. Uh, if you are someone in a position of privilege or power, especially, I invite you to get uncomfortable with me. And we're just gonna dive right into some definitions. When we talk about diversity, which is our first D here, there are two Ds even though it only shows one. Uh, it's in the context of meeting people with different lived experiences from a range of different social and ethnic backgrounds of different races, genders, sexual orientations, religions, castes, education levels, income, partner status, just to name a few. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't include the other important piece of the puzzle that is also a D and that is disability. There is no diversity without accessibility. Um, so we need to make sure that that is a really important part of the diversity that we're representing. Uh, equity, there are actually two E words, everything's doubled up. We're talking specifically about equity, but oftentimes people think about equality as well. Equality means each individual or group of people is given the same resources or opportunities, whereas equity recognizes that each person has a different set of circumstances and allocates resources and opportunities needed to reach an equal outcome. I would like you to imagine two kids standing outside of a park with a fence wanting to watch a soccer game that's being played. The first kid can see over the fence. The second kid can just see the fence and has no hope of looking over it. They've tried climbing up, they grab with their hands and try to do the pull-ups and they can barely get their head up there. But next to them are two crates that they could be standing on. If we were working from a point of equality, we would give each one of those kids a box that would be equal, each kid would have one box. And that might sound like it's kind of fair, but when the taller kid stands on the box, they can still see over the fence. It doesn't really do anything to help. When the shorter kid stands on the box, they can just see the fence. So equity says that the person who can already see over the fence doesn't need help. So we give the shorter of the two kids two boxes and then they can see everything too. Uh, next, inclusion. Inclusion is the action or state of including or being included within a group or a structure. It doesn't reference how you're being included or how the person feels in being included. It is just the act of making sure that there is space for someone, whether it's welcoming or not. I think we need to make sure that it's more than just making the space. It's about making a place that works for others based on their needs and lived experiences, not just on the lived experiences of the people already involved. And that's where we get into the last important letter here, the letter D, uh, which in this case stands for belonging. Uh, sometimes we leave this out, sometimes people work from an assumption that if they are being diverse, equitable and inclusive, that it creates a sense of belonging. I like to call that last one out and say, it takes all of those things, but it also takes us some additional work. So even as someone who's actively doing the, the work, I make mistakes. Um, the first time I saw the, phrase, the, the abbreviation DEIB, I thought it was DE and I in business because I was attending a workshop on it for work. Um, I googled it and understood that my mistake 
was a common one, um, but belonging speaks to making that space for people to bring their whole and authentic selves to work, to the communities, to a project, to a role, and ensuring that everyone feels welcome, accepted, and valued. A good and easy way to think about this is you can invite someone into your home and say, hey, make yourself at home, but they're never gonna really feel at home. If you want to make them feel like they belong, you find out how you can make the space feel more like a home to them than just accepting uh, that they might be uncomfortable in the space as it is. So now I wanna talk about whose job this work is. Back at the beginning, I was saying, if you are a person in a place of privilege, uh, that you should not ask humans, particularly underrepresented or marginalized individuals to do the work of DEIB for you because that is asking them to do emotional labor. If someone says something that is sexist, racist or ableist and a marginalized individual calls them out on it, the person should accept that it is sexist or racist or ableist, sincerely apologize, do some research on how you can do better and move along, but do not ask the person who called out the issue to teach you how to do it. We have vast resources at our fingertips most days. If you're not sure of something, if you don't know what that means, if you're concerned that something that you are saying or doing or building is racist, sexist, classist, ableist, exclusionary, uh, then do some research, look it up and see what you can find online. When I was a kid and I wanted to know how to spell a word, my parents constantly made me look it up in the dictionary. Uh, they must have said that five times a day some days. And in my home, it's Google it. When my daughter asks me something that I know she could find on her own, I tell her to Google it. I am now just telling everyone to Google it. I know we have a lot of things on our plates, but this is something that matters. And the more power and the more privilege that you have, the more of an obligation that you have to understand the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And yes, Sally, it is awkward to look something up in the dictionary when you can't spell it. That was my main argument as a child. <laughs> so you might be wondering, how does this apply to WordPress? Because this is a, a WordPress workshop, right? WordPress is a global project. The software itself runs, last I checked, 42.3% of the internet. It's easy to go into your own little world when you're working with your website, your blog, your organization, your business, and forget that WordPress isn't just made for you, it's made for everyone. The mission of democratizing publishing, which WordPress holds at its core, is so that we are uplifting the words and stories of those who wouldn't otherwise have a chance to share their stories with the world. So without uplifting the voices of marginalized communities and individuals, WordPress would be failing at its primary goal. So as we build WordPress or build our own communities using WordPress, it's important to keep in mind uh, that we need to do this DEIB work, but not just for the software, for the community as well. Not just because it's the right thing to do, though. It is the right thing to do, but that's not why we do it. When we work together to develop more diverse and inclusive teams, data shows that we will be more productive, more innovative, and more profitable. When we encourage and promote folks from diverse backgrounds, they give their perspective to the project and that makes it more inclusive, stronger, and something that can be used by even more people. That's it, that's the bottom line. In fact, that is so important that it's just, it has its own slide. To some people, completely honestly, this stuff does not matter. They have reasons that they think are sound and make sense that they go along in business the way they always have with a homogenous group of like-minded individuals. And I have heard people complain that this is a business or a project, it's not a family, and that business is the survival of the fittest. And if someone wants to do something, they should just work harder for it. Um, that's how equity works, right? Work harder? So when you ask me why DEI is important, my first visceral reaction is to tell you that it's the right thing to do. As a person, I shared already that I want everyone to be comfortable, but it goes beyond that. I want people to feel safe, wanted, welcome. I want them to feel seen and heard and know that their input matters, that our communities and spaces are made better for the wealth of diversity we can welcome. And I will do whatever I need to do to make that happen so that I can make this space where we can all be together, um, a space where we can be our real selves. But that's still feelings, right? It's not business. So the business side of it is, as I said before, 
uh, when we work together to develop more diverse and inclusive teams, everything goes better. When you have one person, you have a single perspective. You have the skill set that they bring to the table, the lived experience that that one person has had. And that one person can build and create and make many, many things with that experience. But the things that they're making are likely to be for people who are like them or for someone who is directly involved in their lives, so much so that the person they're creating the thing for is already a part of their lived experience. Uh, an easy example of this is that my partner loves to cook. He cooks all of the time. I cannot have gluten and he has become an amazing gluten-free chef. The meals that he makes are phenomenal and he makes them because I can't have gluten. So my lived experience has become part of his lived experience. We do see a lot of that. Uh, but if you bring in a second person to work on this thing, do you want another person who has that same lived experience? Do you want another person who's like, oh, I can cook myself and I can cook for a person who's gluten-free? No, you might want someone who can cook for a person who is vegan, a person who has peanut allergies, et cetera. Apparently I skipped lunch. I'm very hungry. <laughs> so if you bring a second person to this thing, you don't want them to have the same exact training and knowledge. You don't want them to have learned all of the same things that the other person learned. You want someone who will see another side of things because more diverse and inclusive teams are more innovative and build better products. A homogenous group of people will just reinforce its own experiences and become an echo chamber. So let's stay uncomfortable. The next step is to just keep going. This isn't a box that we can tick off and say, okay, my DEIB work is done. This is an ongoing way of life. The more we grow in our DEIB work, more often we create more work and see more work that needs to be done. We meet people with new perspectives to us. We gain a better understanding of how we can make the project and the software better and more inclusive. Uh, and that's what we're here to talk about today. I like to keep these instructional portions short so that we can have a discussion. Um, and I'd really love to hear from all of you now. Great, thanks, Cami. Um, do we have any questions out there? Um, please feel free to throw your questions in the chat or if you'd like, any clarification on anything that Kami presented or any details? <laughs> I see. Thanks, Sally Michael. Says, Yay for people under 25 doing all the designing for things used by senior citizens. Absolutely. Michael says, thanks for that. Such a clear and helpful definition. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Maybe so clear that there are no questions. <laughs> That's possible. But then Courtney and I can have a conversation because this is work that she and I have done together for years. So maybe there's stuff that comes to mind that we should. I said I wasn't going to talk about privilege, but maybe we should talk about privilege and intersectionality. Oh, what are the most mm. common mistakes that people make? Good question. <laughs> That is a wide open question. So the common mistakes that people make are thinking that because they've learned something, it's always going to be that way. Uh, I'm gonna use my parents as an example. When I was young, I thought my parents were the most inclusive, welcoming, opening, open people. Like I was raised very much in a household where everyone needed to be themselves. And we were encouraged to respect others for who they are and understand and learn. Um, and as I've gotten older and my parents have gotten older, that hasn't changed, right? They still want to be inclusive. They still want to be welcoming, but they are set in their ways and there is some residual old fashioned racism or homophobia or sexism that sticks around and they're not aware that it's there. And without anyone to call them on it, they will continue to just cycle through that same thing. And it's not just my parents. I mean, I 
fear the day that that is going to be the case with me as well, as I look at all the changes that have happened in society um, to make this a more inclusive place uh, and to understand 30 years ago, we would not have been having this conversation um, and we are now. So what conversations are we going to be having it again in 30 years? Um, another common mistake is when you say something that was not the right thing to say or that was offensive, uh, people will say, I'm sorry, what was I supposed to say? Or I'm sorry I made you feel that way. Or I'm sorry you felt that way. That's not an apology. Um, that's not owning a mistake that you've made. That's putting the onus on the person who you offended. You're sorry that they felt that way. You're not sorry about what you said. Uh, so we make sure if you make a mistake, yes, I'm sorry that you're upset. And you are genuinely sorry that they're upset, but you need to be sorry about you being the cause of that. You need to be sorry that you said something that ticked a box that is from years and years and years of both direct and circumvented oppression. Um, microaggressions build up and eventually there's something that you can't deal with. So as a woman, as a great example, I'm a woman and I've lived my entire life as a woman. That is my lived experience. And I would very much like to wake up one morning and have someone hand me a beautiful gluten-free cookie and tell me that from now on, I will be paid the same as my straight white male cis coworkers. Um, and that no one's gonna talk over me in meetings anymore and that people aren't gonna pass my ideas off as their own. And that would be really dandy and I would really like it. Uh, but it's it's not that's just not how it is so it's also an, a mistake that's being made on the other side is probably uh not recognizing incremental growth we need huge growth um, but i sometimes forget that inter incremental growth is important as well um, and so i know that i get so involved with wanting everything to be perfect um, that sometimes I just need to step back and go, what did this look like six months ago? What have we done to improve? Okay, let's move forward. Um, yeah, those are my, those are my things. That's, that's <laughs> my biggest mistakes. That's my soapbox for right now. Yeah. Yeah. Michael did ask any sense of what type of conversation we'd like to have here. Um, because some guidance would be welcome. Um, like, you know, what kind, <laughs> I know that I like you like to use talks with like, you know, just a, uh, an open, open floor basically. So I don't know if you have. I, I wonder what kind of problems you all are seeing in your daily life that you can identify as a problem of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Is there something that you are seeing happening either at work or in your social circles um, that you can identify where you could do some work to make this a better place? Like I said, this is ongoing work that we all have to do. So this is your this is your this is your time to ask someone to do emotional labor for you. I'm here right now to do some emotional labor if anyone has any questions or has a topic that they'd like to hear more about in terms of DEIB. Otherwise, I'm going to start talking about intersectionality. That sounded <laughs> like a threat, we gonna get into even it. though we said we wouldn't. <laughs> it's a great topic, so I'll discuss it. Yeah, I mean, if you are willing to riff on that, um, that's what we're here for. Uh, we do have a question in the chat. Discussions on DEI seem to be solely focused on one or two racial groups and exclude others um, and cisgender women. What about all the other topics within this area? That is a fantastic question. Thank you, M. So there are two specific areas that I would point to with this. The first one being disability, um, specifically physical disability. So something that you are physically unable to do that someone else is able to do. We don't think enough about that in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. And that's something that's not just an emotional blocker. It's a physical blocker for people. We are creating spaces where people are literally not welcome um, and not being included. So that is, a, that is a huge point that I don't think we focus on enough, even though 
when we look at software, right, we, we do have programs within software to build up that accessibility, um, but not necessarily enough. And it is just as important in our physical spaces as well. And let me reread that. One or two racial groups and cisgendered women. What about all the other topics within this area? Neurodiversity is another one that I seriously take to heart as a person who considers myself and is clinically dis considered neurodiverse. Um, I think that, that we pay a lot of attention to how the standard mind works and to making spaces that work for people who think the same way as a homogenous group of people who are comfortable with specific things. Um, the fact of the matter is that, that there's not a normal mindset. There's not a normal way that a brain processes things. And especially during this pandemic, I've seen a lot of growth in paying attention to neurodiversity and the importance that it plays in DEI. Um, but I still think that it is an area that we're not really looking at. And then if I would tack one other thing, I think every, I think we have so much of our society is unnecessarily gendered. Um, for some reason, it seems so important. If you want somebody to use your pronouns, share your pronouns. Uh, that's totally fine. But why do we need to know what your gender is before you use a bathroom? Or what, why do we need to specify the gender of a nursing parent or why do we like when you sign up to take a course, why would we ask what your gender is unless unless you're trying to find that information, we should just be making something that's inclusive for people of all genders. So that's my bonus one. Oh, you attended a DEI meeting, but no one would even turn on those auto jet. I'm just going to say craptions because that's the, I love it. Those mm -hmm. auto generated craptions are better than nothing. Um, I agree. I'm not sure why they wouldn't turn that on. That is incredibly frustrating. And that's a prime example of a very simple thing that technology has built. Well, that we have built within technology in order to make things more accessible and people often just don't bother to do it. Oh, now the questions are coming in. Courtney, you want to tell me what I'm answering and I'll dive in? Yeah, let's see. Uh, there's a couple of chats, but I'll go to the next question. Um, Michael asks, um, this might be tricky to address, but can you speak to ways to handle the pushback to the generic, generic sense of DEIB practices that get labeled some conveniently dismissible phrase like wokeness? <laughs> Um, there's a sense that awareness, empathy, and inclusion is just a bandwagon of sorts and has become a deritable concept by those who wish to keep things at the status quo. Hmm. That is, a, I like a tricky conversation. I like to feel uncomfortable. That's something I've learned about myself. Um, yes, it is tricky to address. and. I don't know if if any of you have seen some of the conversations that are being had in the WordPress community right now, but wokeness in particular uh, is is someone being woke used to be, I believe, a compliment. I still think it's a compliment. If you told me I was woke, I would be like, well, thank you very much. I try. I try very hard to be woke. And then my daughter would laugh at me. But um, we are turning... Wokeness is the new politically correct, right? We try to be politically correct. And what we're actually trying to say is, I want to be inclusive and welcoming, but for people who have the power, so people who already have that privilege, people who are part of a privileged group and who have never had to walk through the day with microaggressions just flowing at them from every direction to the point where they would rather not leave the house, of course, they don't think that things need to change. And so they're going to cling to that for themselves. And when someone pushes too hard to make that change, they're going to try to rebel against it and say, no, it's fine the way it is. You are just too sensitive. Um, why do you have to change things in my space? Go make your own space. That's the opposite of being inclusive. And that's 
a level of privilege that is truly spectacular. I have a lot of privilege. I have a lot of privilege. Um, I'm still part of multiple marginalized groups. Doesn't mean I don't have a lot of privilege. It is the job of people with privilege to educate themselves, to look for those resources and to not tear other people down. And that really is what I believe that is. It's a defense mechanism for people who are afraid of being unseated from their privilege. We're not trying to take anything away from other people. We're trying to give things to others. We're trying to make this space more inclusive and more welcoming. Um, and so I, I particularly hate I don't like using the word hate. I particularly dislike when people act like because we're trying to be more inclusive, because we are trying to be more welcoming, because we are trying to have equity in a project that we are hurting the status quo because the status quo is broken and there's no way around that. We have to keep building in order to make it better. And there are going to be ripples. I mean, how long ago did women in the United States of America earn the right to vote? Status quo said that uh, women of any race or ethnicity and men who weren't white couldn't vote. And we know that that was incredibly wrong. So we're just gonna have to keep building on that. Yeah, Thank you for asking. A Thank you for yeah, giving me a, a soapbox a to stand on. <laughs> uh, just comment from Sally that I just like to read out loud. Um, uh, she says she's always arguing with her husband that there's nothing at all wrong with social justice. The problem is people who are out there doing a lot of virtue signaling without helping. Um, absolutely, and I agree with that. Um, and she says, also to all the white folks uh, like her, if you don't know Sally, you could look up white privilege in the dictionary and see her picture. <laughs> um, so she said to all the white folks who want to decide how changes get made and how underrepresented people get represented instead of shutting up and getting out of the way. It took her a couple times of uh, getting smacked down for, for her to clue in. Uh, she should shut up and not barge into things no matter how well-meaning she is. Thank you, Thank Sally. You for that, Sally. And there's a huge balance there because you you should not speak for marginalized people, but as a privileged person, you should be using your privilege to uplift their voices, to raise them up and to force other people in places of privilege to understand that their way is not the only way. And M says, someone recently said that DEI seems to be a euphemism for anti-white heterosexual male, and he cannot have any opinions or else he gets attacked. That is a real concern because that feeling creates more division. That is a difficult one to politely answer. Um, and I often start this out by saying, I love a straight white cis man. Literally, my partner is a straight white cis man. Uh, and he has done more work for DEIB than I have, I think, in this world. He is a champion for other people's voices. And I think he still gets his feelings hurt sometimes um, because you can't help it. I do understand that straight white cis men are feeling battered. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that they have been in the driver's seat for all of society in the United States and much of Europe. Um, so we're looking at, let's look at DEIB just in the US right now. The only group who has never been marginalized in the US is straight white cis men. And, and I'm not saying we should marginalize them. I'm saying that our society was built around their comfort and their lived experience. And if someone were trying to take away all of my comfort and tell me that all of my lived experiences were wrong, I would be uncomfortable too. That doesn't mean the change doesn't need to happen. So they can have all the feelings they want. Uh, I would liken this to, if I have plans to go out with a friend 
and I am sick. And I say, hey friend, I can't go out tonight. I'm sick. I made the right decision not to go out. They still get to feel however they want to feel. They can have their feelings, they can own their feelings, they can feel their feelings, but they shouldn't be like, well, that was wrong. Does that, I hope that makes sense. I may have had, that may have been a great comparison. It may have been horrible. I'm not sure what. Yeah, Sally mentions there's some terrific stuff by Bell Hooks about how destructive patriarchy is to men. Yeah, thanks. I will Google that. Sally has a, a comment about explaining to her husband toxic masculinity and how it is toxic to men as well. Um, we raise our children, even unintentionally. I talked about my parents and how woke my parents were when I was young. Um, but even with that, I have an older brother and he was allowed to do all sorts of things that I was never allowed to do. And he had responsibilities that I was never allowed to have. And I had to cook dinner twice a week and I wouldn't consider my parents sexist, but boy, howdy, that was pretty sexist. I had to cook dinner and clean the kitchen and my brother got to do yard work. Um, turns out I was better suited to doing yard work, quite frankly. And my brother was probably better suited to cooking dinner, uh, but we were raised in a society that said girls cook dinner and boys do yard work. So yeah, toxic masculinity isn't toxic just to other people outside of the male landscape. It is toxic to the upbringing of young men who are we, we are putting in a position that they don't need to be in. And something I wanted to mention in, in relation to that is, again, like tying this back into WordPress and the WordPress community, um, people make this assumption that um, all people that are contributing with code are straight whites as males, usually, because I mean, because most of the, the folks that, that are out there and uh, they're representing themselves are uh are those folks. Um, and so we're, we're doing some work to like uplift those, those folks and like the, the all, uh, like women and non-binary led, um, release was, was a fantastic example of uplifting, um, uh, that those folks, that community. Um, I would, is it okay if I, that sparked something for me? Yeah, I remember absolutely. I remember there were some hard feelings around having an all women and non-binary release squad. Uh, I remember watching some people be really frustrated with that and watching others be very supportive of it. I think back, I believe it was Ruth Bader Ginsburg said that there would be enough women on the Supreme Court when they were all women and people took issue with that as well. The fact of the matter is that in our history, I don't know why I keep saying the fact of the matter is like that somehow makes what I'm saying more important. In our history, in our society, there have been any number of completely male-led releases, groups, uh, rule makers, lawmakers, court systems, police forces, that used to just be the normal. You would find women as teachers and nurses and cafeteria ladies. We, we didn't have a lot, secretaries, we could be secretaries. I made a great secretary. It doesn't mean that's what I wanna do with my life. Um, and so I think that the, the all women and non-binary led release was a huge step in the right direction. But I do think that there were people who felt really sensitive about that. And they didn't realize necessarily that there have been plenty of all male releases. It also speaks to, if you go to a conference and 50% of the women, 50% of the speakers are women and 50% of the men are, of the speakers are men, it will be perceived that it is a women's conference. The perception is that there are too many women speaking and not enough men. Whereas if you have 70% of the speakers that are men and 30% of the speakers that are women, people will often identify that it was a proper balance. Um, and that's not even bringing non-binary into the equation. Now, those are just studies that were done when we were talking about men and women. Um, it's something that we have to build on. And appreciating the uh, 
<laughs> the chat that's going on right now. And um, I do want to read it for the sake of the recording uh, as well. Um, so I think this is referring back to when you were talking about your experience with your parents and your brother. Um, there's, there's a comment here that says uh, that then there's the premise that anything traditional is wrong. What if you liked to cook and your brother loved landscaping? How does that work? Um, and Sally says the the issue is having a choice about it, uh, though she has read feminist writers who think that women who choose to be homemakers are somehow undercutting them. She doesn't agree with that. I think um, Sally answered that. I don't think I have to. I will say that I was a stay at home mom and homemaker for 10 years. And it was it was something I needed to do for myself and something that I needed to do for my daughter. It wasn't a man's choice to do that. It was mine. And I was fortunate that I had the privilege of doing that. Um, and to this day, I am ridiculously close to my child. So I know I made the right decision. Uh, but I felt judged by men, by women, by everyone the entire time I was doing that. I felt like I should be doing something in the real world, out having a career and making a difference in the world. Um, but that was my priority at the time. And I would take great offense to anyone who told me that I made the wrong choice. Wrong choice for me. Maybe the wrong, everyone should make their own choice in that particular. And I know, I know men who are stay at home fathers and homemakers because they have either, either because they are both men in a relationship because that happens too, uh, or because the, their wife is the breadwinner. I, I don't I don't see the traditional way as wrong if everyone is a willing participant in it and is educated and knows what they're doing and getting into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just the the chat's coming in faster than I can read. Um, yeah, and related to that, I, Michael says he doesn't think that quote unquote traditional is necessarily wrong. But the assumption that those traditions apply to everyone and should be the expected foundation for understanding one another is the problem. And I'd like to read M's comment if that's okay. So yeah, much tech, go for so it. much tech medicine, etc. It is is designed around abled white men of a certain height, features, etc. This is why facial recognition is so often wrong for Black people. Why auto captions is horrible for Asian or Latinx accents. Why websites are designed without accessibility. Why streetlights are not timed for someone crossing with a walker, etc. Um, One hundred percent. It is absolutely true. Uh, even if we're going back to this round of, of, of COVID, let's talk about that for a moment. COVID vaccines were primarily tested on, on men. And so people, COVID vaccines were primarily tested on people without uteruses. Uh, and so people with uteruses had a huge amount of unexpected side effects that just now, almost three years into the COVID life, uh, we're just now verifying that it's causing problems for people with uteruses. Uh, if you happen to be black or brown and you go to wash your hands in an automatic sink, oftentimes you put your hand underneath that faucet and nothing happens. The lights don't turn on in the bathroom and uh, the facial recognition will not pick you up. It's a problem for facial recognition, it's a problem if you ever have to go through passport control when you're coming into another country, oftentimes they will not be able to read your face unless you happen to be a skin tone that they find readable. Uh, and even with the auto captions, I have found that people with a, uh, particularly with a Jersey accent or a deep Southern accent, it doesn't make heads or tails of what they're saying as well. So yes, we have designed everything for able-bodied five to, 10 to 6 to men who speak with a California newscaster accent. And that's just not the way. They're, they are not the majority of our population. They are just the people who have always had the controlling interest. I, I really, I believe that WordPress is doing better than that. 
I believe that we have a lot of work to do and a lot of growth, but I believe we are doing better than that. And I do believe it's a priority right now. And it's part of the reason that I'm still doing the work that I'm doing, that I'm still at Automatic, that I'm still in the WordPress community. I think open source is one of the only ways that we are ever going to have software that is truly um, equitable and inclusive. I'm not sure if I can keep up here. And some of the conversation is related to uh, the earlier question. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow, things did escalate quickly. I think some of this we want to <laughs> move on from. Um, all mm -hmm. valid comments, just I don't think anything that we need to bring into the workshop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something new I learned from you just now is that uh, that term newscaster accent. Um, I've, I've heard like radio voice or <laughs> I don't know if that's like big, uh, the the same like accent or the way people speak but um that's the reason point. the reason i'm familiar with that term is because i grew up in um, texas in south texas and i learned to speak there so i was born in california i moved to texas i spent my formative speech years and then i moved back to california and i was immediately taken and put into speech therapy in the california school system because they said they couldn't understand what i was saying and they uh declared my accent a speech impediment and so the state of california required me to go through speech therapy for years that is where i learned the uh, west coast newscaster uh, there's a certain way that you're supposed to speak as a newscaster and if you'll notice newscasters all over the united states tend to have the same west coast accent because that's how they're trained to speak clearly and that's what we consider clearly a yeah, small thing uh, I try to do um, with these workshops or any like recording that we do is that I do run it through another uh, captioning service because as folks have already mentioned, the auto captioning is not very good. Um, and so trying to run those through another captioning software, but then I manually go over it and correct it because we have folks with all sorts of uh, speaking styles and accents. Um, and this is a global community, so yes. you know we want to to be able to have those captions of the, of the spoken words to be accurate. Um, and I realize that sometimes, like with word camps, maybe that have like dozens of talks, they might not have the I don't know the the volunteer power to to do that and. Um, well, I'm going to make a plug right now for folks to contribute to um, the WordPress TV team because, oh, uh, yeah, you, you can volunteer to to do captions for any of the videos. My first contribution uh, outside of organizing and speaking at WordCamps, my first contributor day contribution was captioning videos for WordPress TV, and it is a lot of work and it's so worthwhile. Mm -hmm. It does take a lot of time and needs a lot of volunteers yeah. and, and headphones yeah, easy way to yeah it's an easy way to contribute <laughs> to get started to contributing to the project i think we have one more question time for one more question um michael asks uh speaking of wordpress uh, and of not asking disadvantaged people to do the emotional work of explanations has there been any work to put together a site or resource where we can send people to investigate the issues around problematic behavior or statements? Um, a bit of a more formalized starting point. Yes, ish. The community team has a site where you can go. It, it, it very much reads like you're reporting a violation of something, but anytime that there is an issue that comes up, you can go and send a report through. Courtney, do you happen to remember the URL for that? Courtney will get the URL. Right now and I'll share it in the chat. Fantastic. So yes, we do have a system where people can bring up issues that are problematic, uh, whether it is something that is an ongoing issue that they're seeing or whether it is something that happened at a WordPress 
social learning space, uh, meetup, word camp, either online or in person. That's something that you should bring to the community team. I am also working with someone within the community um, to build out our DEIB resources so that we have a dedicated place that people can come to to talk about that. But that's um, I'm something I'm working with Allie Nimmons on, and I'm really excited, and I hope that she and I get to bring that to fruition, but it's still in its early stages. Yes, the code of conduct incident reporting. So it sounds like it's very much a code of conduct violation, um, but it is the catch all for things like that right now. Uh, Courtney has yeah, dropped it in. It's Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna, it's make.wordpress.org slash community slash handbook slash WordCamp dash organizer slash planning dash details slash code dash of dash conduct slash incident dash reporting. We should probably get like a short URL for that at some point so that people can more easily access that because that is not accessible. It's a lot of work to get there. Yeah, that's actually the, the handbook page on uh, incident reporting in the um, for WordCamp organizers. Um, but the actual incident reporting form ah. um, is a lot shorter. <laughs> um, and even though this is on WordCamp.org, it does apply to the WordPress project. So um, uh, Michael did clarify that he meant more to help others understand the impact of the behaviors rather than reporting. Like, do, is there a resource? Um, that is something, and Michael, if you want to ping me on Make WordPress Slack, if that's something that you'd be interested in getting involved with, let me know, because we are putting together a group of people to work on these things, and I think that's a fantastic idea, and I would love to figure out how we can make that uh, a priority right from the beginning of what we're working on, not from the beginning of the project, because then we need a time machine. Yeah, I don't think that, we, that the WordPress project has a... Yeah, it does not have it this yet, but yes, it's been in the works. Yeah. Um, and finally, it mentions it has been hit or miss on inclusion, even at these WordPress events. Um, when the instructor introduces something that goes against accessibility, some will accept feedback that corrects it, but some will make comments like accessibility is out of scope of the discussion. Hmm. I don't like that. Uh, he, I, I don't like that that happens. I, I'm not mm. saying I don't like that you said that. I'm glad that you said that. I have seen that um, accessibility needs to be in scope for every discussion. I can understand if we are saying, hey, let's figure out the functions and then we figure out the accessibility. But just like we look at cost and um, the amount of time that's put involved, that is involved in something, we need to look at accessibility from the outset that it should not be an afterthought. It should be something that we are building into everything that we do. Um, me saying it should it should be doesn't make it happen, um, but know that yes, it is very much something that some people in the project are super keen on ensuring that we work on. It is something that I hear at every event. It is something I would like to see and hear more of, but I, I don't think I remember ever Matt doing a state of the word without someone asking about accessibility in the Q&A afterwards. So I think we just need to get it to the point where it's discussed before the Q&A uh, at every event. Mm -hmm. And I think as, as a matter of fact, uh, a workshop that is focused on accessibility has been an ask for a while. So um, I, I will mention that I've been doing some research and reaching out to some folks that may um, have a little more expertise there so we could all learn. Um, I can learn along with you too. So um, yeah, that is in the works. Um, <laughs> yeah, and mentions that was probably, probably them asking for accessibility for a while. Yeah, had a few folks ask at uh, WordCamp US as well. All right, I think that is it for questions since we're almost at the top of the hour. Um, but yeah, again, thanks for this conversation, Cami. I think that the thanks. conversations after your presentation are always the the most useful or you know, I 
like having those conversations with folks and just hearing and learning along with folks. So um, yeah, just to close up, I want to say thank you everyone for learning with us. Um, you can join more online workshops like these and watch some tutorials at learn.wordpress.org. And again, if you're interested in hosting one or co-hosting along with me, um, I would love to hear from you. Um, you can join conversations at chat.wordpress.org. That is a Slack instance um, where all the folks that are contributing to the WordPress open source project um, you know, work on the project and we can chat there. Um, so thank you folks for, for being here and thank you, Cami, for your presentation. Thanks for having me, Courtney, and thank all of you. Um, it's I'm really passionate about this, and so any chance for people to willingly listen uh, brings me great joy. I really appreciate you learning more and being involved, and you're all great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, this is important for not just the WordPress project and community, but for, for everyone, so I'm glad that, that we had this conversation. Thanks, all.